Well, like Jim, um, I'm also going to talk um, about the great unknown. Um, and like Jim, I don't have any idea uh, what's going to happen uh, after the judiciary, after the 2016 election. Um, but I can talk about some of the opportunities uh, that President Trump uh, has before him um, and the potential impact on the, on the federal judiciary. And the place I'm going to start um, is looking at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so about 15 years ago, with my collaborator Kevin Quinn, who's on the Berkeley Law Faculty, uh, we developed a statistical model to measure the ideology of Supreme Court justices. And the input to the model is just a vote matrix. This model, we go back all the way to 1937. And we take the roughly 50, 60, 70, non-unanimous cases a year and just code how each of the justices voted on each of those cases. Are they in the majority or are, are they in the, uh, uh, in the minority? Um, uh, we then developed a model that allowed the justices to evolve ideologically through time. The reason why we developed this model is because Justice Blackman, right? We knew that he changed quite dramatically over the course of his career. As a, as a measurement exercise, we wanted to develop a statistical model that would capture that intuition. So what this uh, graph shows you, this was published in the New York Times uh, last summer, um, is the location of the median justice in yellow over time, going back to the late 1960s. You'll see the median justice today is Justice Kennedy. And as political scientists, we care a lot about the median justice on a committee that uh, makes decisions based on majority rule because that median justice is going to be pivotal um, um, on, uh, on the most important uh, cases. What you see today, um, or at least actually not today, before Justice Scalia passed away, is that Justice Kennedy uh, was the median justice. Um, at the same time, we also see that Justice Kennedy had been moving steadily to the left. This is true through the 2014 term, and as we update the data to the 2015 term, that same trend continues. And that's not terribly surprising if you think about many of the decisions that the US Supreme Court has reached over the last couple of years. Right? Think about both the constitutional and statutory ACA cases. Think about the gay marriage case and some of the death penalty decisions uh, that the Supreme Court handed down. So we made, made the claim that the court has been moving slightly to the left over time. Now, to be perfectly clear, um, this isn't by any means uh, a liberal a court. Um, one notable, uh, one notable uh, example um, is in the voting rights area, uh, right, where the court made a very conservative decision, which in fact we might see um, in some of, some of the post-election analysis might have actually turned this election um, in a couple uh, in a couple uh, of, uh, of uh, key states. So we, we see a court um, that's been moving to the left. And then, of course, Justice Scalia passes away um, uh, earlier, uh, earlier this calendar year. And that, of course, changed everything. Right? When Justice Scalia goes away, the median justice, and the median justice today is either Kennedy or Breyer or, or sort of anyone, uh, anyone in between. Right, we have a court today that's deadlocked, and of course in a 4-4 court, right, if we can't get five uh, votes for a particular, uh, for a particular outcome, right, the lower court opinion stands and precedent is not, sent, uh, not set nationally. In other words, the Supreme Court basically punts uh, on the issue. President Obama, Obama steps up, nominates Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland is someone respected by both Democrats and Republicans uh, in Washington. And what does the Senate do? The Senate does what every good dean does whenever they have an opportunity. The Senate temporizes okay, and does uh, nothing with the idea of let's see what happens, um, uh, let's see what happens um, at the election. And so in this figure, uh, we did some analysis to try to find out who are the likely people that Clinton or Trump would put on the U.S. Supreme Court. So we wrote a paper about uh, 10 years ago called The Judicial Common Space, where we were able to map the Martin Quinn dimension into the nominate dimension, uh, which is based on congressional roll call voting patterns, to allow us to do some triangulation to see where, in particular, uh, federal circuit court judges are ideologically. What you can see is pretty obvious, right? There's a whole set of individuals uh, that candidate uh, Clinton was talking about, uh, which would have shifted the median far to the left. Stephen Breyer would have been the median justice. Right? And at least initially, these are some individuals um, that candidate Trump uh, was talking about a few months ago. Um, and of course, replacing uh, Scalia with one of these justices would reinforce Kennedy's position as the median justice. Now, since the election, Trump has talked about um, a broader range of candidates. Um, and in fact, some of those candidates are as far right as Clarence Thomas. 
but he's actually been talking and floated some names of some state Supreme Court justices that we believe may actually be to the left of Anthony Kennedy. The question is, what is he going to do after the election? And the answer is unclear. Now, why this matters so much has to do with the magnitude of swing uh, that we're looking at on the court. Uh, so here, um, we see uh, the, same, uh, the same ideological scale. Uh, we have the median justice uh, denoted by these dots. This, of course, was produced before the election when we thought that, that President Obama might be able uh, to make a nomination. And we were going to see a very dramatic change. Right? We were going to see Scalia replaced by somebody sort of right around, we would expect, uh, uh, Kagan dramatically, uh, dramatically change uh, the center of power on the court. Now, that change wasn't as substantial as when Clarence Thomas replaced uh, Thurgood Marshall, but a very big change nonetheless. Of course, we're not going to see that change, right? Uh, because the one thing I would promise you is that the Senate will not confirm Merrick Garland in the next month, right? And so our new president will be able to nominate the person uh, who will be the next uh, justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. And that nomination really doesn't change much. It doesn't change much because Kennedy's been the median justice for a long time. Kennedy will be the median justice thereafter. What really matters is what happens next. What happens next is we have three justices who are, I would say, to be uh, polite, not young. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 83 years old, Anthony Kennedy is 80, and Stephen Breyer is 78. Just actuarially, Right, the likelihood that President Trump is going to have a vacancy on the Supreme Court over the next four years um, is pretty high. And if, either, if any of those justices leave, that's going to be, that's going to be incredibly consequential. Right? If Kennedy leaves, Trump is going to be, in a sense, picking the median. Right? And if one of the two justices on the left leave, and we're going to be looking at a Supreme Court with six conservative uh, justices uh, for some uh, period of time. Now, I mentioned the strategy in the Senate was to temporize, was to not act. And the question is, did that strategy work? Well, the answer to that question, I believe, is yes. Right? One reason it worked is that Trump, they, they rolled the dice, Trump won, and so the Republican, a Republican president is going to be able to fill the vacancy. The other thing to look at, though, are the Senate races. Right? Were there Republican incumbent senators that were punished for using this strategy? And the answer to that question is no. There were 20 Republican incumbents who, re, who were reelected. There were two who lost, Mark Kirk in Illinois, and of course Kirk wanted a vote on Merrick Garland. Right? Uh, the only person for whom uh, this stand might not have worked terribly well was Kel Kelly Ayotte uh, in New Hampshire. Um, uh, her opponent did run some advertisements, and she did lose a very a tightly con contested ra a race in New Hampshire. One of the things that that suggests uh, for the future, uh, particularly for the Democratic minority in the Senate, to the extent that they can temporize on uh, presidential nominations, not just for the Supreme Court, but for the lower courts as well, they may not face electrical, uh, electoral retribution for doing so. That has some very profoundly negative implications for the judiciary and the ability for the judiciary to get things done, um, but it may be a politically feasible strategy um, in order to get like-minded judges on the courts. The final thing I wanted to talk about um, has to do with the lower federal judiciary. So what this graph shows you are the number of vacancies every month at the beginning of the Obama administration uh, through today. And so the, 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 the line on the bottom are the number of circuit court uh, vacancies, um, and the line at the top, um, uh, the, the dark gray line on the top, the number of vacancies in the district court. So when President Obama came into office, there were a fair number of vacancies uh, in the federal, in the federal uh, judiciary. And he had an incredibly slow start getting nominations to the Senate. Right? You can see over his first couple of years in office that the number of vacancies um, more than doubles. Right? And this is, when he's got a, this is when he has a Democratic Senate. Right? So President Obama had a very hard time getting the administration organized and just getting nominations uh, into the Senate uh, in order uh, to be able to fill some of these vacancies. Um, a, a little year and a half into the job, he's getting a little better, and some of those vacancies uh, uh, begin to be cleared. There's another peak up and then a peak down. Um, and then, of course, everything changes early January 2015 when the Republicans take the Senate. Right? And what we see since then is a growth 
both at the circuit court level and at the district court level, in terms of a huge number of vacancies. Right? President-elect Trump is going to be given an opportunity to replace a huge number of judges uh, in the district courts and in the circuit courts. And I would, I would hypothesize that the U.S. Senate is not going to confirm a lot of folks who have been nominated and have been sitting in the Senate um, over the course um, of this summer and fall. And so President-elect Trump is going to have an opportunity uh, to fill a lot, 80, 100, 120 district court judgeships, um, I guess is 20, 25 circuit court judgeships in the first year or two of the Trump administration. And of course, he has a narrow majority in the Senate which might make getting those folks confirmed uh, relatively easy. The big mystery is whether he's going to be, to be able to do a better job than the Obama administration getting things organized and ultimately getting uh, nominees put forward to the U.S. Senate. Um, uh, given what, we, what, we're, what we're seeing now in the transition, um, I think the likelihood of that being a nice, streamlined, um, organized effort is probably not there. Uh, but ultimately, we'll see. I mean, this is a huge opportunity um, for the president-elect to dramatically shape, to reshape uh, the federal judiciary. Thank you.